Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Two new justices have recently been appointed to the Supreme Court. My guest today, Nan Aaron, is the president of the Alliance for Justice, the organization that led the opposition to their confirmation. As you said, this is pretty depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Let's talk about the, what happened. How did this happen? <laughs> well, I, it's interesting when you, when you look at the Senate, because, of course, the president nominates, but it's yeah. the Senate that really has the final say. And when Roberts was nominated, over half of the Senate had never voted on a Supreme Court nomination. So I think well, there was... interesting, because when was the last one? A, a, a learning curve. Yeah. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The last two were oh. President Clinton's. Right. Breyer and Ginsburg, and both yeah. of them were not controversial. They sailed through, and they sailed through in, for one very, two very important reasons. One... Both of them were very mo moderate. Yeah. Um, but two, President Clinton did something that George Bush, President Bush, didn't do, and that is he called up Orrin Hatch, uh, leader of the Republicans on the judiciary, and he said, Orrin, I want to nominate these two. What do you think? And Orrin Hatch gave his blessing, and the so. two of them sailed through. Of course, that didn't happen with either Roberts or Alito, and I'd say neither sailed through. I think both right. of them um, caused a great deal of resistance, but in the end, uh, there weren't enough votes to defeat right. them, although at least in Alito's case, 42 senators, Democrats, said no, which I think is... Uh -uh. helpful and symbolic for the next one, should there be one. So what do you think the result of this is? It's changed the balance in the court. Well, it's, in a way, it's very early yet. And um, there have been a number of decisions that have come down in the Supreme Court, and most of them have been non-controversial. And so yeah. most of them have the justices agreeing with each other. But of course, we haven't yet heard about some of the more difficult, thorny cases, and we'll know in a couple of weeks. One involved the Clean Water Act. One involved a very important Fourth Amendment uh, Which is what? case involving knock and announce before a, a police official goes into a home. Was that the case that was just decided? No, this is a different one. Um, there was a case that was just decided where they voted unanimously. What was that? It was not having a search warrant? Right. Um, and I think that was a, a, a pretty easy one. But mm -hmm. I think that the more difficult one is, is coming up. So it's, it's mm -hmm. really too early to tell. But it's clear that uh, the Senate just confirmed two very young justices in their mm -hmm. 50s who will be on the Supreme Court for decades. And both of them have records of hostility to civil rights, worker protections, public health and safety, opposition to privacy. And I, I don't think it's accidental that right after Samuel Alito was confirmed to the Supreme Court, South Dakota mm. enacted one of the most repressive abortion statutes in the country. Which will I eventually think. come before the court. It will, although I have a feeling... Maybe it, nobody will bring it. I don't think anyone's going to accept it only because there aren't yet the votes, thankfully, mm -hmm. thankfully, to uh, mm. overturn Roe versus Wade. It's, do, do, I mean, both of these men, people fear, are against choice, right? Is that an assumption because they're both Catholics? No, I mean, both of them um, had experience uh, making decisions, writing briefs, uh, rendering opinions when they were at the Justice Department and on the bench. And from what we know about their work, both of them at the Justice Department, as well as their work on the, on the circuit courts, both of them are anti-choice. In fact, one of Alito's most astounding acts at the Justice Department was this memo he, he authored in which he was very proud of the work he had done 
to whittle away at Roe versus Wade. I mean, that was a fact of pride yeah. for him, and, and frankly, for Roberts, yeah. too. Now, your organization, Alliance for Justice, does a, all the, most of the basic research on the, right. the, on the nominees, right. right? And then you send it to the senators? Right. First you send it to the Judiciary Committee members, and then to the whole Senate, both parties? Right. And do you help the senators? I mean, when you watch the hearings, they, they have questions prepared. Do you write some of those questions, or do they take that from your material? They write their own yeah. questions, generally speaking, yeah. but they've got our reports and And they depend sheets. on them. Sure. They do, and the press does, and we work very closely with a very large coalition of organizations that are also engaged in reviewing judicial nominees. And because they're interested in different, I mean, your alliance is an alliance of a lot of organizations. Right each of w uh, that represent interests that the courts can affect. Exactly. Right? You know, the court, both at the Supreme Court level and courts of appeals, make decisions that affect almost every aspect of our lives, the environment, public health, consumer, worker protections. Almost everything in America comes down to a right. court decision, and therefore, Groups that belong to the alliance, the environmental, civil rights, consumer, mental health organizations, have always looked to the courts for some yeah. kind of redress for grievances. Yeah. So it's very important. And it's not yeah. only the Supreme Court, it's any member of the federal bench that you... Right. We look do. at not just <coughs> Supreme Court nominees, but Court of Appeals as well as District Court. Ju judges as well. So, and this president has appointed a, a very significant uh, number of judges at, at all levels. In fact, a, a recent study that just came out this week shows that the judges that he's put on in the lower courts, that's the Court of Appeals and District Courts, have already um, had a huge influence in our society. This is, I mean, he has really put on people, pe appointed people who represent the conservative wing of the party and the ideology. Right. It's really, it's... It's been very systematic, um, and uh, he's been largely successful in getting his nominees confirmed right. by the now Senate. They, they, Kavanaugh, what's his first name? Well, there's an a individual lawyer who was actually in charge of judicial selection in the White House for a number of years. His nomination to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals will be voted on this Thursday. And the D.C. Court of Appeals is an especially important court. It's right? the court in the country that hears most of the challenges to federal regulatory programs. So uh -huh. the most important cases involving the environment worker rights, civil rights, consumer protections, are taken to the D.C. Circuit, which is in the District of Columbia. And the Democrats have not been happy with this man. No, the Democrats <laughs> haven't been happy. Unfortunately, I don't think enough of them are, are unhappy with them, so I don't think we'll did Reed be say successful. That, did did the, the, majority, the minority leader say that they were going to filibuster his appointment? No. Oh. Um, Harry Reid, minority right. leader, um, I think has indicated that, at least up until now, that there won't be a filibuster, uh -huh. which means that Brett But Kavanaugh he wasn't part of that group that got together. Right. What right. did you think of that group? Well, there what is a group. What do they call themselves? They're called the Gang of 14. Right. And this was a group of senators, seven Republicans, seven Democrats, who came together uh, last year to avert what was called to avert a, a big showdown, which yeah. would have been the nuclear option. The nuclear option. <laughs> and they came together to avoid a vote on the nuclear option, which, if it had passed, would have eliminated the, the filibuster oh, altogether. Um, we were, at the Alliance for Justice, pretty disappointed with the agreement reached by the Gang of 14, and unfortunately, I wish we had been wrong, but unfortunately we were right, and history bears us out, and uh, all, they did save that filibuster. There's no question about it, but then they haven't used the <laughs> filibuster. Yeah. They put it somewhere. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think if they were willing to save it, you, you, right. there are 
is, times what's Kavanaugh's so. first name? Name is Brett Kavanaugh. Brett. I always want to call him Bro or no. Bo or something. <laughs> it's Brett Kavanaugh. And, and he is really... His claim to fame and what brought him to the attention of the White House is that he wrote portions of the Star Report, oh, the Ken, Ken Star Report, and also wrote part of the articles of impeachment on Bill Clinton. And that's the, the reason he's come to, to be a nominee to the D.C. Circuit. So he's already been voted out by the Judiciary Committee. He is, and so his nomination's on the floor. Are there going to be some Democrats who are going to try to say we should filibuster this nomination? I you don't think so. don't think so. There will certainly be, an, I think, a large number of no mm -hmm. votes, but not enough to to prevent his confirmation, which is too bad. And he's another young man. Oh, he's in his 40s. Yeah, so oh, he'll be he, there for uh, a long time. Yes, he certainly will. <clears throat> now, also, I read in the paper that there was a meeting of conservatives at the White House last week or right. recently, where and Karl Rove went. Of course. Because they're trying, for some reason, to build up their conservative base. Well, that's because they're afraid of the elections that are coming this November, right? You, you know, think? Every two years, <laughs> Republicans, one of the ways they ramp up their base is by talking about judges. Because to the right wing base of the Republican Party, judges translate into abortion, gay rights, taxes. Right. And um, it's whenever you, you'll notice, you'll begin to hear even Bush talk about judges and justices close to November. It's it's kind it's of a signal. And they always talk about tort reform. I mean, that's oh, all, always. Oh, absolutely. That's and, a winner, and, too. And I'm sure many people don't even know what tort reform is, but <laughs> they talk about it. So right. their plan is now to send, what, 17 nominations for the yeah. federal bench across the country? Right. To the Senate before November. Correct. In the hopes that they can pack, continue. I mean, they're really packing the courts right. or trying to. Right. Their hope is to send these nominees, even though they're controversial, the more controversial the better, right. because it provides an opportunity for President display. Bush, yes, to have a big fight. And while Kavanaugh, I think, will ultimately be confirmed, there are a couple other guys in the pipeline who have met a great deal of opposition, and I don't think they will. I don't think their nominations will move forward. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, one guy is, is Terrence Boyle. He's being considered for a seat on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Those are the Carolinas, West Virginia, uh, Virginia, and Maryland. I don't think he'll make it. Um, he this this is a he's been a district court judge, and as a district court judge, he's over the years voted against civil rights disability rights. He's been reversed by the Fourth Circuit 150 times, twice Is that really true? the times 150 of the times? average judge. But recently, it was disclosed that in the middle of hearing a case brought against General Electric, he bought stock in the case uh -huh. and then ruled in favor of General Electric. And that's not just a single instance. It, 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 we now know that he's He's rendered decisions in cases where he had financial holdings um, in, some of the, in one of the parties, corporate parties. So I think he's under a very, very big cloud. And the other very contro <laughs> controversial nominee is a guy from Mississippi, Michael Wallace, um, a protege of Trent Lott's, who was president of the board of the Legal Services Corporation. And while he was president, he hired a lobbyist uh, to try in an effort to gut the agency and um, eliminate its budget. It's crazy. Yeah. He just received a very rare rating by the American Bar Association, which was a unanimous unqualified by the ABA. So I don't, I don't know that he's going. Yeah. To this I seat. hope not. Right. <laughs> I hope not. Exactly. It sounds. It all sounds so depressing and overwhelming to us, and it's another important reason why people have to pay attention to yes. Senate races. Yes. Um, but you don't concern yourself only with judicial appointments. Correct. Some issues, right? Correct. Class action suits. We deal with class action suits. We also 
um, work very closely with nonprofits around the country and have been leading the effort in Congress to try to make sure that if Congress enacts lobbying reform or campaign finance reform, that, what, that they don't, in the process of doing that, impose rules and requirements, owner's requirements, <coughs> on nonprofits that really hamstring them. So we've been very actively trying to keep Congress from um, limiting what nonprofit organizations can do. But in a way, those issues are, are a little different. In the mm -hmm. class action suits, I mean, they're once again defending big business. Correct. And, and Congress unfortunately enacted legislation which moved a lot of class action suits from the state courts to the federal district uh, courts. And the problem with that is you, with all these new Bush judges, uh, most of whom were picked because of their pro-business right. leanings, it raises the, the prospect that plaintiffs, that ordinary people, won't fare very well in these courtrooms because the judges, because of their own leanings and predispositions, will rule in favor of big business. There was a, um, there's a, there was a story in the New York Times about two principals of a California law firm that does only class action suits right. who've been indicted. Right. D uh, uh, and they're accused of paying, what, paying people to a uh, To secure and procure clients for, for their firm. Right. Do you think that's all part of this action? I don't. They no, don't, I don't think I'm, so. I'm, I'm paranoid when I, I say that. <laughs> I think that's a singular instance because there are so many law firms around the country that that do the Lord's work in terms right. of bringing these difficult, tough cases now in these courtrooms before these very conservative judges. So I think that's uh, not, it's certainly not typical of the way most law firms, particularly small civil rights. Somebody once inside. told me that there's a saying that things are so bad these days that even paranoids have real enemies. <laughs> so anyway. Well, I think what's important is that we keep reminding Chuck Schumer and Hillary Clinton, how important this issue is. Chuck Schumer serves on the Senate Judiciary Committee. He's a very powerful member of that committee. He's a leader in that committee. Um, and I think it's up to all of us to... to so what is he doing? I mean, is, did he vote for either of these appointees? No, he no. didn't vote for either Alito or, or Roberts. Did he take um, a strong enough stand? We want Chuck... <laughs> Schumer to, um, on the next go around, certainly, to uh, stand up for fair, independent and he's, judges. And he's got a, I mean, he's in a very good position because he's, he's supporting candidates yes. for the Senate. And one of the, but he, I, I don't know what we can expect since he's supposed to be a big, strong advocate for choice but he's supporting a candidate who's against choice in Pennsylvania, right? I don't know, but that's a little hard, I guess. It, he could basically say, you have to vote with us on the judicial appointments. Well, we're hoping he will. And yeah. Obviously, everyone is waiting for the November elections yeah. to take place, the senators on both sides of the political aisle. So will they be able to delay these uh, confirmation hearings that I are going to get sent down? I think, I mean, I think, you know, I think if it were up to George Bush, they'd happen tomorrow. Right. But I think both sides. Senators like Schumer, Durbin, Kennedy, What about Laney, some of the Republicans? They, they understand. You, we've got to really know who these people are and know what their records are before we Who are the Republican them. members of the Senate that stand with you on some of these? None. None. <laughs> Not many. None. Chafee um, yeah. was with us on Snow. Alito. Snow and Collins, two pro-choice. Senators uh, were very disappointing. Very well, they disappointing. They were part of. Were they both part of one? Of, Susan Collins was part of the Gang of Fourteen or whatever. I don't it was. think. I Ronnie thought one either. of them was. I'm not sure. I don't think either of them is. But you know, I think you're going to call yourself pro-choice. Then you can't say you're pro-choice and then vote to confirm for a lifetime appointment. Right. Judges and justices who are. Is the federal against, bench also a lifetime appointment? Yeah. I mean, that's. Is that a good thing? That it's lifetime yeah. appointment? Yes, I think it's it's ideal because theoretically, 
uh, <laughs> the, the notion is that judges, once confirmed, because they never have to be confirmed again or run for office or run for the position, have the ability to, to be independent right. of the president, of the party um, to which they were affiliated. So I think it is a good thing that there is lifetime tenure for judges. Um, but <laughs> because of that, we would hope that the senators would appreciate that fact and That's take it. a little bit more time and use a, a little bit more courage in saying no to confirming someone whose record is is unacceptable, as so many of these nominees are. Do you are. think that you can ask a nominee a position, what their position, I mean, it isn't that they have to say, yes, I'm in favor of choice, right? Is it at a hearing? Well, I think there are certainly ways to give a nominee the opportunity to talk about privacy, not just choice, but privacy. I mean, here we've had a president who's engaged in warrantless surveillance, authorized torture around the world. It One would assume, expect that nominees would be yeah. asked questions about their views. They don't need to talk about how they decide certain cases. Right and that they wouldn't be confirmed until they explained their views. Neither Alito nor Roberts um, gave to substantive responses, unfortunately. Do you think, um, aside from the federal courts, do you think, do you have an opinion about whether judges should be appointed or elected? Oh. We always have this debate. Oh, I, th I, <laughs> I, pro I think I support the appointment of judges. Uh -huh. I think, um, I'd rather rely on that system that, than one that has the general uh, public, the general public um, because, voting. Because it's a Only complicated system. It's complicated. I don't know that American people really focus on people's records and they, you know, associate judges or candidates with positions on guns, taxes. And generally speaking, you don't really get a sense of what mm -hmm. a nominee's mm -hmm. record is. And furthermore, so many of these campaigns now are waged and funded by pro-business organizations, including uh, chambers of commerce. And while chambers of commerce do very laudable things, one of the things that's not so laudable is they fund campaigns in the states of nominees who are pro-business and which hurts workers and ordinary people. So that comes down to regulations of what? Workmen's compensation? Oh, yeah. So, all these kinds of things. Let's just talk about tort reform because that's the, sure. the thing that gets thrown out. What is tort reform? Well, tort reform is um, a term that, re that, is, that refers to efforts by big business to make it more expensive and more burdensome for individuals to get access to, to state and federal courts. And what tort reformers seek to do is make it more expensive. They try to limit the ability of ordinary Americans to get damages once they win their case. Um, the, their proposals are to put a cap to pr pr on the put awards. A cap on, on the awards. And um, they, it's an effort that, like judges and judicial nominations, that kind of peaks around election season because Republicans love to bash lawyers and talk about tort reform. And I think if most Americans really knew what was being proposed, that Democrats and Republicans would rise up against it because I think we all look to a court system um, for, for help to mm -hmm. resolve our problems. It's our final last resort. It, it's it, our final last resort. So when they, they go from tort reform to trial lawyers. Right, right. And the trial lawyers always get the bum rap. Right? Yes, absolutely. Because they get mixed up with ambulance chasers right? or something like that. Is that what right. happens? Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, there are ads in newspapers and they're all, these campaigns are run by, by big business. And it's, the goal is to allow 
big corporations, corporate defendants, um, to allow them to go free, unfettered, and free of liability. Do we have more of this than we had 40 years ago or 50 years ago? Or, I mean, we're now in a, in a, we see the big business influence on deregulation of everything. We see it in the courts. We see It's all around us, isn't it? Well, I think oh, certainly a Republican administration, and this one in particular, yeah. which is very business friendly. I mean, you can see it in mm. every area. Um, of our lives certainly fuels, uh, helps to fuel the agenda of big business and tort reform, making it more difficult for people to sue corporations that harm individuals um, is part and parcel A of class the agenda. Action suits, is that part of tort reform? It's certainly part of tort reform. Yeah. So do you have um, a program, and we have very little time, for young people? Uh huh. Also, on campuses, law schools, um, or law what? Law schools, and and uh, we we produce a film, mm -hmm. um, which is out every fall. It's a short film, fifteen twenty minutes, and this year's film is going to look at the effort by a group of right wing foundations and big businesses to fund programs that tilt the law in a pro business direction, and uh, we hope to be working with law schools around the country. And people will be able to look at your website. Yes. And to contact you or to keep up with what you're doing and to keep up with what the Senate is doing and yes. what the President is doing. Yes. Thank you very much, Nan. Thanks for having Thank me. You. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.